Okay, so we're live now. Well, we're setting up the live in a sec. Should I give it a second? Yeah, give it a couple of seconds. And we're good to go. Perfect. Good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today, we're here for a conversation between the UN Special Repertoire on the Health of Everyone to the Enjoyment to the Highest Attainable Standard of Physical and Mental Health, Taleng Mofukeng and Young SRHR Advocates. Young people are simultaneously positioned to experience multiple systems of power and oppression that affect their ability to comprehensively realize their sexual and reproductive health and rights. These systems intersect with one another to reproduce systems of inequality that systematically perpetuate the exclusion of young people from discourses and spaces where decisions about their right to bodily autonomy and self-determination are being made. Consequently, the special repertoire in solidarity with young people's demands is today in conversation with youth advocates to discuss her 2021 report to the General Assembly. In the first report to the General Assembly, the special repertoire Sorry, it's the whole thing on the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health focuses on sexual and reproductive health rights and the opportunities and challenges, ar challenges arising during the COVID times. Before I start, just some logistics and structure of the, the session today. Um, we will have a live panel uh, discussion for the first 30 minutes, and I will introduce each of the panelists we have today, and we'll ask them uh, a pretty deep question just to kind of highlight their work and their, their share their, their knowledge on these subjects. And then we'll go into uh, a live Q&A. So if you have any questions, please send them to, I think there was an email link sent through, through registration please send them there and we'll, you'll have the opportunity to ask uh, the special repertoire and the youth advocates we have here your questions. Um, and as for logistics, there are some meeting guidelines. So please make sure that your handle is your first name and then your last name. Please raise your hand and wait to be called on to ask a question or to participate. And this will be in the second half. Keep your mic off unless you're called on to participate, please. And if, you, if any of the participants start displaying inappropriate or harmful content through the chat, microphone, or camera, they will be removed from the meeting. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I'll launch right into it. So um, brief introduction. I am Suk, my name is Suk Thin Fol. I am the treasurer and member of the Youth Coalition. And I am a lawyer and SRHR advocate currently working in Geneva, Switzerland. Our first panelist, of course, is Dr. Tlaleng Mofukeng. Uh, and like I said, they are the United Nations Special Repertoire, and they are also a medical doctor with expertise advocating for universal health access, HIV care, youth-friendly services, and family planning, as well as comprehensive sexuality education, training, and facilitation, and content production. Welcome, Dr. T, as, as they're often referred to. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has not only highlighted and exacerbated existing issues through the uneven vaccine rollout, as we see perpetuation of deep global inequality, protection of industry and state interest is taking priority over everything. So why a report that focuses on sexual and reproductive health and rights at this time, when there are enormous other health-related issues, including lack of vaccine accessibility, and ideally, what do you hope this, this report will achieve in this global turbulent times? Welcome, and you have the mic. Uh, thank you so much, Rick, and um, thank you to all of the youth um, advocates who have come together to host me for this very important conversation. I think it's one of the most exciting for me, simply because I'm so closely related and connected to the work that all of you do. And um, personally, as a, a, you know, as a medical provider, but also as a young person myself, um, I know firsthand the challenges of adolescents, um, of young women, of um, 
gender non-conforming persons and the different policy practices um, and laws and legislation that continue to keep us out of services and goods and accessing um, and realizing our rights. And so it was important um, at this time of the pandemic and the General Assembly report to reflect broadly on other implications and other impacts of the pandemic, because we know it's a viral respiratory illness, right? But we've seen how even with the response to the COVID-19 vaccine and what many people are terming vaccine apartheid, you've seen a replication of the power imbalances and the power asymmetries that have existed historically between colonizing countries and those who are colonized. But the language that's usually used is the global south and the richer countries or the developed nations and the less developed nations. And so for me, it was important to bring another perspective, another angle to the discussion around COVID-19 because it is more than just a medical or a biomedical issue. It's a policy issue, it's an issue of systemic and structural inequality. And um, in, many, in many countries, you know, when I, when I uh, started working on this report, one of the methodologies we used was, um, you know, publish a call out for contributions. And, you know, more than 66 individual organizations, as well as some of the member states, you know, responded and, and, and submitted their own experiences of, you know, the pandemic and how it has impacted on sexual and reproductive health rights. So for me, it was really important to not forget these very important um, service related or healthcare related um, uh, points. And we know that in many instances, sexual and productive health rights, it's almost like that um, step cousin that no one likes to really talk about, you know, um, and so with the regressions and the political climate globally that sees anti-gender equality, anti-gender politics, um, anti-intersectionality, anti-critical race theory, it's important to see them within that spectrum, right, of colonization, of racism, of erasing certain people in society and not seeing them as fully human. So when people are entity critical race theory, which were an intersectionality by the way, which are important frameworks that oppressed people used to make sense of the world and what was happening to them as they fought for their human rights. So if you erase that, if you deny that, it means you are denying the humanity of large populations in the world. And that's why my, 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 my entry point, the lens that I use it's about, you know, looking at root causes, but being deliberately anti-racist, anti-colonial, but also proposing and looking forward um, using intersectional frameworks and, and really substantive equality being the ultimate goal to restore dignity. Because substantive equality takes into account the fact that we are all located at very different points. And I'm gonna use a very interesting term um, that uh, one of your panelists is on here, MX Mohoran when he talks about multi-locality, we are all at very different points in our lives and we may shift and move between class at different stages of our lives. We may move uh, between socioeconomic status. We may move um, in terms of the life cycle, the reproductive health cycle from being a young person who needs you know, assistance with adolescent care to being a postmenopausal woman. And how do we then intentionally have healthcare systems, policies, um, and legislations that take all of those different multi-localities into account? And that's why for me, it was important to take a step back um, and really talk about sexual and reproductive health rights in this time, because we know many governments um, don't like talking about sexual and reproductive health rights. They don't want to recognize them as rights. And so they don't fund uh, programs that are geared to that. And with the shrinking civil society space for activism, it becomes very, very important to also then be aware and be intentional on how the work, especially for me, of an independent expert, how does that help everyone in the system, member states, equally as civil society, because I believe that civil society are a very important um, partner in many of these issues that we are, that we are dealing with. And I, I deliberately called it sexual and reproductive health rights um, because I wanted to locate 
health services and the provision of care within a rights framework and not separate it um, from the conversation about rights because many governments will then talk about their statistics about their programming in health. But when you look at the policy guidelines, when you look at the granular detail, they are still not offering transgender health affirming care. They are still not offering, uh, uh, you know, dignified services for adolescents, for example. They are still criminalizing um, same-sex relationships. But yet they will tell you about reduction in maternal mortality, which is still very much a uh, um, reflection of a society that says heterosexual, right? Um, and that enables them to then not really be wide enough and inclusive to other people who need services. And that's why I locate the healthcare provision within the rights framework, the same way we talk about policy and legislation um, within that same framework. And I don't separate the provision of health and health services um, from rights. Thank you so much for that very, very informative answer and the report itself as well. Um, I'm going to move on to our next panelist to discuss more about the report. Uh, Unice Garcia, my colleague at Youth Coalition. Unice is a human rights defender from Mexico. She holds a Master's of Law at McGill University, sponsored by Open Society Foundation and McGill Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism. She's an expert in advocacy, defense, and research. And in June 2020, she was appointed the Executive Director of Youth Coalition, for sexual and reproductive rights, and of course, she's been with us since. Inise, um, we have experienced this at Youth Coalition often. Um, it, in a very peculiar situation, it seems that youth and their demands continue to be ignored completely as a group, but in a very disingenuous way, um, we see that youth as a group are now slowly becoming faces of advocacy for many influential big spaces. How does this report resonate with the genuine needs of needs and demands of young people? Thank you so much, Suk, and thank you so much, Dr. Naleng, for this conversation. Actually, I enjoyed reading a lot this report, specifically this one, because I think that, I don't know if it's like that I haven't read other reports like this uh, because I haven't found them or something like that. But I really felt that it was the first time that I read a document from the UN that actually addressed colonization and other aspects of, of sexual and reproductive health and rights that are key priorities for young people. So while I was reading this report, I was really encountering so many points of intersection between the report and the demands of young people, specifically around decolonization, but also around the need of including gender non-conforming folks to lead the conversations on gender equality and sexual and reproductive health and rights. Because I think, I, and, and this is something that has came up from the work of the Youth Coalition, how centering the identity, centering the experiences, and centering the bodily autonomy of folks uh, of non of gender non-conforming folks is key to address different aspects of sexual and reproductive health and rights that other um, communities can also benefit from framing this like that. Um, of course, we saw in, in the report the need of hormonal treatment, not only for LGBTI folks, but also for um, older women, which I thought that it was very interesting how like two completely different groups of people can benefit from the same policy, right? Um, of course, the criminalization of LGBTQI folks, the maternal mortality, harmful practices. And I also found it very interesting, the approach to sex work that I found in this report, because this is something that not many um, documents, many official documents address. And I think that this is key because this has been highlighted as some of the priorities of young people. And of course, this comes with all the tokenization and other barriers that young people have to deal with in, in the daily basis, in high level spaces, in decision-making spaces. And I was also asked to, to talk a little bit about like this tokenization and, and how do we 
um, instrument, instrumentalize um, like the, the youth identities in these spaces, right? And I think that it is key first to, to realize and to know that these are key priorities for young people and that we might have different priorities that adult gatekeepers and that is okay. That's where diversity comes alive from, from different groups of people having different approaches and different perspectives. And I also think that, of course, there is always this point where there is a struggle between participation versus leadership when it comes to young leadership, well, of young advocates. And this is why in the Youth Coalition we have... Um, work really hard to push for co-ownership, co-leadership, and co-design of the spaces, but also to enable the spaces that are only for young people to organize themselves and to talk about their priorities without um, like other um, influences coming into this space. And this this is one one proof of that. And this is like one effort that we are are making, right? Like this type of conversation where young people can feel that they are really owning the space. Um, it is really important also to recognize that young people have their own priorities, as, as I was saying, that representation is key, that accountability has to be always um, there as a transversal issue of every single advocacy agenda where young people can hold their governments accountable, but can also hold other stakeholders accountable for the inclusion of meaningful youth participation as a, a priority area in these spaces. Um, I'm, I'm always uh, trying to make this note when it comes to, for example, in the report, I found something that was really interesting about like the agency of young people, the agency of adolescents. And I think that this is key in this, in this subject of tokenization because in many ways um, we found as a youth-led organization so many initiatives that are targeting young people, but so few of them are actually allowing young people to take the lead on these initiatives and are, and very few of these really take um, like young people as partners and as equals and, and really, um, you know, like take into consideration their expertise as, as what it is, uh, expertise, um, because we really believe that there cannot be youth-centered policies without meaningful youth participation. So I think that those are my reflections of, of like so far. I'm, I'm gonna leave it there. So thank you so much, Suk. Thank you very much. Um, we actually started almost a reading group at YC where we read the report, went through it very deeply and basically highlighted all the things that we haven't seen before in, in similar spaces and similar reports. So thank you for the answer that very nicely captures all of the things that we would have liked to see in those spaces, um, but we haven't yet. So it's very refreshing and very important to have it. Thank you, Nisei. Um, moving on to our next panelist, we have let, okay, I'm sorry. I know I asked you about this. We have Leto Gonolo uh, Mokoren, uh, a South African lawyer. They have worked in gender justice, sexuality, and gender rights. They have a keen interest in race and gender and its relation to the law. They hold a master's of law degree from the University of California, Los Angeles, and a dual specialization in critical race theory, critical race studies, and public interest in law and policy. And they have just completed a report on public opinion about transgender people and their rights in South Africa. And like it was highlighted to me, this is a very complicated question. So as Dr. T has already highlighted, the COVID-19 pandemic has eroded many of the gains made in the field of SRHR and the rights of marginalized people have taken an absolute backseat. With the ongoing and impending climate crisis, we can anticipate continued deprioritization of SRHR rights. Um, we can also anticipate continued politicization of certain rights over others, which leads to greenwashing, pinkwashing, et cetera. So how do we then prepare ourselves to not only retain our progress in SRHR and other intersecting fields in face of ongoing and upcoming crises, but also work as a collective? <laughs> I, can't wait I, to said, <laughs> I think this is a really, really difficult question. But I think um, the starting point always for me is this. I think oftentimes we think of climate change as a separate issue to SAHR 
and we think of racism as a separate issue to SAHR, or we think about the pandemic as a separate issue. And I think that is where the problem starts. Because we've created these isolated problems and isolated areas, we aren't able to move forward. And that's exactly what the question comes to. The question comes to this idea of if we've, we know we've made some progress and maybe in certain areas, tremendous progress, but we're going to see that progress and we've already seen it and the report highlights this specifically and really accurately that we're going to use the pandemic, the climate change as a scapegoat of saying, oh wait, these rights are not important. But the truth is these rights are important because the people who are affected by climate change are us, right? And we're, we're going to continue being affected by this climate change in adverse ways because we don't have access to comprehensive health care, we don't have access to comprehensive family planning and all those particular things. So for me, I think really how we will get to where we need to go is that we should stop thinking in silos. We should stop saying it's an SAHR issue and it's a climate change issue. We should say, actually, this is an issue that affects everyone. And I think the pandemic really is an opportunity for us to see that, right? That when we begin to see that like COVID-19 doesn't care about race, doesn't care about class, doesn't care about nationality, it cares about everyone. But the impact of COVID-19 is exasperated by someone's class. It's exasperated by someone's sexual orientation, gender identity. And in those instances, those particular instances, we need to start fashioning ways in which to say, how are we able to address this problem in this particular way, right? And that's how we will collectively begin to think about managing these crises. Without that sort of thinking, we're going to continue, you know, um, making the same mistakes that we've been making, that as soon as a bigger problem, climate change comes on, a global pandemic, we're going to sweep this. And I think that's what the report is saying to us. The report is saying to us, these problems have always been a problem. These issues have always been on the back foot, but they're going to continue being on the back foot on the guise of we focusing on the pandemic, we're focusing on climate change. But actually, no, you're not focusing on the pandemic and focusing on climate change. You're using the pandemic and climate change as a way to continuously deny us the rights that they really exist, right? And I think for me, I always think of the words of Sarah Hamed, uh, particularly when I think about queer folks, trans folks, and uh, gender non-conforming and non-binary folks, is that our lives have already not been admitted as lives. And so it's so easy for us to be depoliticized and being moved to the margins because people don't see us as, as people. So I think for us, when we begin to see people who are queer, who are trans, who are gender non-conforming as people, then we'll begin to know that they are also deserving of these rights and that climate change and the pandemic affects us even more so than anyone else because we're already excluded from the narrative. Thank you very much. Thank you. That, that was exactly as, as satisfying I, I expected and more. Um, Moving on to our next panelist, we have Itumeleng Lestowalo. They are based in Johannesburg, South Africa, um, a young feminist and traditional healer from Lesotho. She is a South, or oh, South, oops. She is a social justice activist, passionate about women and girls and the LGBTQA plus, I plus community. Currently works as a content producer at a youth think tank called Youth Lab while also using our social media platform for digital activism. Itu believes in the power of storytelling to impact social change and hopes to always bring the lived experience of marginalized people to the forefront. Thank you for joining us. Um, so again, this has been highlighted by many of our panelists already. Um, colonial regimes deeply impact the rights that were now afforded and their impact continues to live on through their enforced laws and policies globally controlling gender and sexuality. This also includes a clear distinction between validity of traditional methods of healing and what we know as modern medicine. So how do we move towards a decolonial framework and way of working and center our pre-colonial legacies, especially in the sphere of gender and sexuality? Okay, hi Suk, um, thank you so much. 
um, yeah, and greetings to everybody. Um, I'm quite nervous, so I'll be referring to my notes um, a lot. Uh, firstly, I'm so thankful for the invites to engage on the special reporter's uh, first report to the GA representing Youth Lab. I would also like to thank um, the special reporter for all of her work and continued collaboration with grassroots activists and organizations. We truly do feel seen and heard by you. Um, so I'm going to start by saying that, you know, the colonial regime has negatively um, affected access to healthcare in that it pushed out um, indigenous um, healing methods and structures, creating a dependency on a system that is already exclusionary to um, those who don't have proximity to power, right? So this compounded with the effect of um, patriarchy on the lives of women, girls, and sexually and gender diverse people is the reason why SRHR is so inaccessible. So a holistic approach um, is most important when addressing the challenges of marginalized communities, right? Um, and I believe that integrating community care workers into the implementation structures is key in making healthcare more accessible and holistic. So, for example, instead of dealing with the violent system at a clinic or hospital, patients are receiving services from people who know them and are invested in their overall well-being, right? So, um, in the case of a traditional healer, for example, their work doesn't end when, you know, consulting and diagnosing, but because they are part of um, the community also in the capacity of com as community leaders, um, they, the knowledge that they have about the needs of community members is valuable in bridging the access gap and ensuring quality services, right? Um, even where there are personal biases, having the option to go to someone whose values and beliefs you know and align with your own builds safer spaces for marginalized populations. Right. So in the case of a self-administered um, abortion, for example, community care workers are able to act as a support structure and also provide counseling and aftercare. So it is absolutely necessary to decolonize the healthcare system by enabling the work of community care workers, as well as investing in the research of indigenous healing methods. While there is room for traditional healing methods in the broader healthcare system, the Witchcraft Suppression Act implemented by the apartheid government in South Africa largely impacted the relationship that marginalized groups have with indigenous ways of healing. So traditional healers do continue to uh, be villainized and face you know, violence in their communities. Um, this stigma is a huge um, barrier to accessing holistic care. So there definitely needs to be a shift in the lens through which we view traditional healers and the, you know, the spaces um, that they potentially could occupy within greater society. So yeah, community care workers, viva. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank much. you. Next, we move on to our final panelists for tonight. And they are Shivangi Agarwal, a disabled and queer activist and artist from Delhi, India. They work as a consultant, researcher, writer, advisor, and facilitator with an emphasis on advocacy for disability, sexuality, gender, policy, and accessibility. And you can find them on Instagram and Twitter, and I can post their, their handle for everyone to reach out. Thank you for being here, Shivangi. Um, as, as we all know, um, rights are deeply interconnected and influenced by the same systems of oppressions, systems that are deeply entrenched in our lives and even internalized by most of us. And even in, in for example, good organizations, we reproduce the same systems through our own systems. So how do we actively challenge these systems of oppression in our daily lives and not just in work-related activities, especially as a young person living through this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Sook. That's such an amazing question. And uh, there are so many systems of oppression 
that affect our daily lives. And today I'm going to talk about capitalism and ableism specifically. Uh, I feel like uh, this pandemic ha has meant more than ever that we need to question everything that we know about sex, sexuality, gender, ability, health, mobility, behaviors, and relationships, communications, everything has changed, I feel. And we really need to reimagine uh, all of these forms of uh, relationships and communications that we uh, have ar around us. And this means that we don't have to assimilate anymore. Uh, we really need to question and challenge the policies and uh, laws. And we, and, we, and we can learn a lot from disability justice activists and queer trans communities uh, that have really taught us uh, about so much uh, of uh, a generational trauma that uh, has accumulated in our bodies and um, how it is affecting us even throughout this pandemic. There, is, there has been so much isolation and lonely, loneliness uh, and I feel like uh, disabled people have always lived in a, in a pandemic world. We know what it feels like to be abandoned by our caregivers, by the government, by, the, by our biological families, uh, and even by the medical system. And um, in India, we are considered like a burden until we can prove our economic worth. So it's not just, you know, like, uh, like you said, it's not just the workplace, but our families, our education system, our healthcare. And uh, we really need to challenge all of those laws that are uh, affecting us. Uh, like, for example, uh, our housing, housing laws. Uh, which uh, we, which we saw that the rental and uh, landlord issues were ex uh, issues were exacerbated because uh, of the pandemic, where people weren't able to pay their rents, weren't able, and there was so much um, violence towards uh, people who were uh, renting spaces, and uh, yeah, there were so much housing issues. So uh, I think uh, one of the things that I've learned is about inter interdependent living and. Uh, and really uh, challenging those housing laws, the rental laws that are out there. Uh, then we really need to be challenging the economic policies. Like there was so much financial stress and job loss that was experienced during the pandemic. And uh, I think like one of the ways uh, that we can uh, advocate for our economic rights is to, to learn from our ancestors, like learning about barter systems. Like I, I, saw, uh, I saw so many people who were exchanging um, knowledge and information with each other uh, for free, not, not for free, but like for exchange. And, uh, and that, that really made a big difference for people, especially when it comes to consulting uh, medical professionals and mental health professionals. Uh, we really need to be also challenging like laws on abortion and ideas on consent and bodily autonomy. And uh, this, this, all of this really takes anti-capitalist work, like demanding collective access and collective liberation through deinstitutionalization. Uh, as Itu, who spoke before me, uh, said that learning from our ancestors and learning from traditional he healing methods and investing in communities now more than ever, we need to dismantle the medical industrial complex because, and the mental health industrial com industry, uh, which I have, you know, experienced, uh, uh, and that also means like by advocating for uh, for our environmental environmental rights. So, uh, yeah, those are those are things that I am constantly thinking about, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's all I had. <laughs> Thank you. That, that was a lot and um, I need to pause because I am still observing uh, all of my favorite things to discuss. Thank you for highlighting them so nicely. Um, should we have reactions? Uh, oh, sorry. Um, so moving on to the next panel or before we do, um, I would like to invite the special repertoire if they want to add anything to what's been said, or if they want to highlight something or critique something. Thank you. Yeah, so first I just want to say, I mean, for me, it's very encouraging um, to have 
all of you connect with the work um, and analyze the work. And I think I'm looking at this as much as a sharing, but also a learning opportunity for me. And as much as we talk about um, being inclusive, right? I think it's important to actually start getting into the granular details of what does that look like in the health system? And one of the ways that um, coloniality, colonialism and racism has really disrupted um, in terms of how we think about care and holistic care, and I'm going to draw from all of what the panelists were saying, is that firstly, um, it, it demanded the siloed approach because then it only understands hierarchy, right? So even in medicine, there's even a hierarchy of care. There's a hierarchy even in, in just the way we engage with each other within the medical system. There's a power asymmetry um, that enables that hierarchy to happen. So I agree in that many of the um, non-Indigenous westernized ways of, of, of providing services isn't as affirming as we would like to think. And this is why part of the work that I do, and I suppose it's, it's also because I, I truly believe in, in holistic medicine and, and, and the connection with the, between the spirit and the body and the mind. Um, this is why I do believe that we have to have a better integration between indigenous and non-indigenous health systems, but that would require us to decolonize because at the moment, a lot of the African, Indian, Asian, spiritual and traditional um, you know, health systems are still demonized, right? Um, and they are seen in a way, <clears throat> excuse me, as inferior or as actually not adding value to patients' care. And, and as much as we can talk about Western medicine and the different interventions, many people still trust their traditional um, uh, health practitioner before they can come to the westernized um, space. So with COVID, for example, and the vaccine hesitancy and the fact that people had contraceptive um, uh, 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 interruptions and stockouts, it was the traditional healers, the traditional you know, uh, practitioners who were at the forefront um, of that. And, and so we really have to think very intentionally and broadly about the kind of health system we want that serves everybody um, and and I really agree with, I mean, what Ivangi was saying about that the system sees you only when you have some economic benefit to it, right? And this is why personally, I've been having issues with this youth demographic dividend talk, right? Because it's, it's almost like you invest in the youth because they are the future labor, uh, you know, uh, production, but, but no one is actually thinking about the individual person. What do we do to make them thrive and assist them transition healthily from the different phases of their life? It's almost, well, we need economies to develop. We need infrastructure. We need people to do this work. So let's invest in the youth. And there isn't a real investment in affirming and protecting the rights um, that the youth um, deserve and have. Um, and are only really seen. And so I understand when you mean with people, you know, living with various degrees of disability, um, that, you know, you, you are constantly dealing with issues of autonomy and, um, uh, uh, and dignity in the medical, um, you know, uh, um, faculty when you are seeking services. And I think that's why then my approach, and I think what you guys are saying is that it's correct <laughs> in that I am taking a, an anti-colonial, anti-racism, um, and a non-discrimination approach to the right to health, because I really think that it's 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 um, it's important to not just you know say these slogans about leaving no one behind, but we have to literally do it, and I think that's one way of doing it by being um, you know clearly and uh, consistently talking about um, you know the important principles of equality and non-discrimination. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Mike was off. Thank you so much for that. Um, a personal phenomena I've experienced in the past, at least during COVID, is young people are becoming so anti-capitalistic. And it's amazing. Like, it's amazing. People younger than me, um, even where the next generations coming up are 
like they see through the kind of the, the facade that's been created of like these neat systems that essentially just control them or criminalize them or um, only, only uh, uh, give them any benefit when they provide some sort of service or some sort of labor. So I am very, very excited about that. And I, I can't wait to see what kind of world we create. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. T for that answer. And moving on to the next session, we have um, a little Q&A. Um, I think there's less time left for that now, but that's okay. So if anyone has a question they would like any of the, they would like to ask any of the panelists, could you please raise your hand? Or you can also um, either email the question to us, which was sent to the email, uh, sent in the email to you, or you can put it in the chat box. Thank you. I see you, Nise. Um, well, well, other folks, other youth folks, please, everyone is welcome to, to send your questions. But while everyone is uh, sending their questions, I, I would just like to reflect on, on the things that were said here, um, because um, I think that this really also like talks um, or, or like responds to a lot of what young people have been asking for. Uh, for example, like Shiva and Dr. T and also E2 have mentioned like the importance of decolonizing in the sense of like moving away from these structures that sometimes become barriers instead of like enablers for young people to access and exercise as RHR. And I think that one of the most important things that we have been pushing for as activists is to actually support young people so that young people can, I think that young people have demonstrated in the past, for example, with self-managed abortion, how the networks of young people can be super helpful to actually address and to provide the services that the regular health system is not providing. How self-managed abortion, for example, is something that came from um, las jefas from las favelas from Brazil and how like this this didn't start in the medical system this started because women were organizing themselves because folks like young folks were organizing themselves so I think that this 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 resonates a lot with youth demands in the sense that we have been asking for support to fund youth-led initiatives peer support peer services peer whatever like young people have the power, have the knowledge and have the networks. And they do this because they love to do this, not because they have to, right? So this is something that we have been pushing for from, for, from the Youth Coalition. And I think that it's beautiful, this conversation. Thank you so much for that, Yunise. Anyone? Sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Uh, we have a question in the chat and we also have a hand. Uh, I have a made, I've made a note of that. So I'll just read out the chat question and then we'll get to your hand. Um, Larisha says, I would like to ask Dr. T, what is the role of digital health in advancing SRHR? How can technology be used as a tool of advocacy and substantive equality? It is amazing because I actually wanted to suggest um... Uh, we speak about the different possibilities with digital um, health and innovation, and I know that many of you on this call um, have, you know, contributed in either designing or content um, or policy, right, to support the implementation of digital health. So COVID kind of forced us to do and realize this vision much quicker than we had anticipated. And one of the things, in fact, um, there's a few in the report. I'm just gonna go look for the examples quickly. Um, but there's been a few countries who, who have adopted um, digital health for abortion care, for example. Um, and then I know in South Africa, for example, the Health Professions Council, which governs the practice of medicine and gives the doctors the license to practice, have been very rigid for many years with telehealth. But with COVID, they actually relaxed some of those policy guidelines to enable telemedicine um, and telehealth. And that has really opened up the space a lot um, for sexual reproductive health rights. We know that the right to sexual reproductive health rights 
also involves the access to information. And that information is important that it's evidence-based, that it's credible to then enable informed decisions to be made. And so we know in terms of health interventions around abortion, contraception, um, different fertility needs, hormonal therapy, trans transgender health, um, reproductive cancers and screening, you need information to be able to make good decisions for yourself. And so even if you are just looking at the ability of digital innovation to just give young people information, it's amazing. And I think that information should be coupled with information about their rights. A lot of countries, and I've experienced this as a, as a young person, I mean, I'm now an elder youth, right? I'm, I'm still young, but not so young anymore. So I'm like in that very awkward phase. I'm an elder youth. And um, in my younger youth days, I remember how difficult it was um, to mobilize other young people on a particular issue because they simply didn't realize or look at those issues as, as human rights issues. And so I think digital innovation has a very good, uh, uh, um, it gives them a good opportunity to be able to tell as many young people what their rights are because they are suppressed in many instances, right? It's not that, People just don't know about their rights just simply because they are not interested. The media is controlled. Some people um, on different um, calls, by the way, with, with young people can't even use their real name. You know, they have to use a VPN to connect so their government doesn't track their, their activism and their advocacy. So it's very important to also think about privacy, confidentiality, but also safety um, with these apps. And who controls that data? What do they do with that data? And um, I think though with COVID, it's undeniable that digital health is a really incredible, uh, powerful tool for all of us to, to look at. And as my upcoming um, reports in the next couple of years, I will be looking at um, doing a report, looking at digital health um, and, and those innovations as they relate to the right to health. And that, of course, another call for contribution will come out. And I think it will be great to get all of you to input into that in terms of what it can look like. If you're thinking about visual aids, right, for people who have particular um, difficulties you know, with um, with gadgets, um, sometimes the font is so small, you can hardly, you know, make out what it is. So when we say we have to think about all of the different people who use these products, we may have to think about different interfaces of digital innovation. The, 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 the digital um, infrastructure in many of our countries is quite poor. And where there is fiber and connectivity, data costs are quite high. So it then becomes another barrier so we may have, and we have to, not may have to, we have to then talk to colleagues who are working on the right to development, who are working on IT and infrastructure, who are working you know, in financing to say, how do you prioritize infrastructure that enables young people to access information regardless of where they are um, in a way that takes into account aud uh, visual and auditory aids that takes into account language. Many of us use English, without even thinking about who else needs to hear us, right? And even if we wanted to, and in many instances I've had this, where we've convened meetings and we simply cannot afford to self-fund, right? For different translations. And so that becomes a hindrance. So even the way that global health financing and, and, and resourcing is structured, young people are still seen as tokens, like you guys use the word, and I agree with that. There isn't a meaningful participation at decision-making levels and, and the process. You come in at the end to give approval and just to be like, oh, well, the youth was consulted. But why we need the youth to participate at every single step is that you can advocate for line items that speak directly to the issues and to the um, different needs um, that you have. So I think, yeah, that's important um, as well. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I really look forward to, to seeing what the, the, the next phase, right, of innovation will look like in many countries where even um, safe abortion you know, was able to be done through telemedicine in a way that it hadn't been before and um, we sh should not go back. So I think that's what we must be vigilant about. We've seen that it works. 
So let's build on that as opposed to going back to making policy that, um, you know, uh, makes it illegal for doctors to do telemedicine. Instead, we should be looking at policy guidelines that further enables that and then coupled with digital innovation um, that doesn't perpetuate the existing problems. Because remember, the online, offline uh, uh, prejudices, discriminations can very easily be copied and be perpetuated and into digital. If artificial intelligence, if the person coding is sexist, if the person coding is uh, racist, if the person coding is ableist. So we need to then think broadly about who is doing the coding. So that's why we need feminists in IT and STEMI. And we need not just women. We need particular people with a particular agenda to move forward in, this, in, in some of these things. And it could, it, it's as simple as who is coding the app. It could be as simple as that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so, so much for that. And, and for not only highlighting so many of the issues and how interconnected everything is, but also we work collectively in, in collaboration because the issues are so interconnected. Um, I won't say any more, we will go to, we have so many questions. So first we'll go to the raised hand. Uh, Asile, do you want to maybe turn on your mic and ask your question, please? Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you to the panel and thank you, Dr. T and the rest of the panel. It's Asile, um, that, that's how to pronounce it. My question is, I mean, Dr. T has possibly tapped into it in her previous response. But I want to tap into the, the gender divide gap looking at um, technology within Dr. T's um, report. Because we've seen with COVID, there's a lot of digital intervention and this has impacted development. Um, on the other side, we have seen quite a number of reports, particularly in South Africa, where the girl child is, is written about as the water carrier. That's the terminology that is being used in these environmental reports. And my question here is, how do we narrow the, this gender divide gap within the digital space in ways that take seriously the issue of development and the issue of education within the continent broadly, really? Thank you. Thank you, um, Esitia, for that. So yes, um, this is part of the bigger agenda for gender equality. And I see all of the different efforts and the different work that many of us are doing in different spaces um, connecting here and intersecting here. Because of course, many countries will be looking at, you know, accelerating progress towards sustainable development goals. And goal five is about gender equality, goal three is about health and well-being. And so you can see then how digital health is important um, for achievement of gender equality. But we need the girl child to not be socialized, to be the one that does free labor in the house, who does the free chores, who does the care of the sick and the elderly when parents can't because they are at work. And so the entire socialization and the social fabric would need to change to enable long-term change. And that's why we then also always talk about structural issues because we can have all of the fancy solutions, but if we are not paying attention to why right now with what we have, things aren't working, um, we won't get where we need to get to with the pace that's required. The other thing, of course, and I presented um, at the Human Rights Council a few weeks ago on this digital gender divide, and um, even where communities or families where there is a gadget, it's most likely going to be the boy child's gadget um, and the girls will be told, you know, oh, if, if, even if they are even given that opportunity, I sometimes I doubt, you know, but the, the point is that even where there is access, it's still gendered in terms of how um, services and those, um, you know, goods then become available to be used um, by, 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 by women and girls. And let's not forget a lot of uh, gender non-conforming people are already kept out of services and these innovations because many of them will refer to women and girls getting pregnant. And just even in the languaging itself, it already tells people that this isn't for me. 
So even when we're thinking about fertility, when we're thinking about um, you know, fertility assistance and the fact that actually assisted fertility should not be something that is so expensive um, and, and that is reserved for people in a particular class. What about women with disabilities who need um, assisted fertility methods and, and, and in other support, you know? And so the way in which we then think about the gender divide, even in health services is important. Digitally, yes, in terms of digital innovation, but it gets replicated in many other instances. Um, and so I agree that we need to pay attention to that um, and the exorbitant data costs, I mean, and the power cuts. I, I live in Johannesburg where every other day there could be a power cut. And the problem is that people say then, what do you have a plan B for when, they, when there's a power cut? And I say, well, I don't have a plan B. You know, um, it, it's such that I live in a country where we don't have consistent supply of electricity. City. And how does that then impact the outcomes and 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 then you know the ability for people to access services? So it's important to connect the dots and the underlying determinants of health, especially when you talk about digital innovation, are important because you need the infrastructure, you need the power supply, you need the fiber and the connectivity, and that's part of the bigger agenda of development. So we can't, and I have this argument all the time, we can't keep saying countries are developed if they are not protecting and promoting and affirming human rights. There's nothing developed about you if you are abusing and violating rights. The, 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 the marker of development should be to the extent of which countries protect and promote human rights. And at the moment, even the so-called developed countries, in my view, are not really that developed after all. Absolutely. I think we're all nodding our heads or sending hearts and signals on, on Zoom to agree with that. Uh, thank you so much for the question and the answer, Dr. T. Uh, moving on to questions from the chat. Uh, Karen asks quite a long question and would like to hear everyone's thoughts. Um, so maybe certain panelists can answer certain questions, however you wish. Uh, as part of the youth, how do we best make impact from a micro scale to a macro scale in pushing for SRHR? What habits and values should we learn to work on and prioritize to be able to contribute mindfully to our current society amidst the pandemic we're going through right now? Lastly, how do we best adopt a positive mindset throughout all of this and how can we stay inspired? if anyone wants to answer any of those questions. Or I can voluntold and pick. Um, I, can, I can just be very brief uh, and say that uh, I think rest is very important and grieving is also very important. Right? We have lost so many of our ancestors and elders uh, we have lost so much knowledge and there has been so much environmental devastation. Um, so grieving is a really important, important process. And one of the things that I've learned a lot from uh, my, my disabled elders and ancestors is crip time, uh, which, is, which basically means like taking your own time and uh, taking uh, time moves differently for different people. So, so resting in that way and uh, really learning from the history of uh, the history from our queer and disabled elders and ancestors is, is one of the most important ways to have um, a change in mindset and uh, thinking about like inspiration through uh, yeah, our, our elders. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Shiv. And if I can call on my colleague, Eunice, to answer the bit about how do we best adopt a positive mindset throughout all this and how can we stay inspired? Because I know you deal with Oof. stuff at YC. <laughs> how do you do it? That's a good question. I, I think that, first of all, I think that we have to recognize that young people are exhausted of dealing with tokenism. Like it is exhausting to have to explain to partners and stakeholders that young people organize differently than young people need, have different needs, that young people can create what, when, when 
the the scenario where when when the places are youth friendly and flexible, right? Um, I think that um, like there, well, there, I, I saw there were like two parts of this um, of this question, and I think that the first one is like how how can we keep like the like the um, sorry, let me see what what was like the exact question. Da -da 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 -da. Give me one second. Yeah, so like, how can we make like a, like a good impact, right? And 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 I think that first of all, for the youth coalition, one of the key priorities is not to elevate the voices of anyone because we we always see this, right? Like we always see like this type of language being used when other uh, folks are targeting young people. Like let's elevate like the voices of young people, and it's like no, like let's make a space for them to actually be able to sit at this table and let's dismantle the white structure that is embedded in all of these advocacy spaces in all of these decision making spaces so that they can actually participate the brother is not like what do we do to make young people like um, like to, to be able to be engaged it's like how do you transform your space so that actually like the space is friendly for other people and I think that to, to stay um, like motivated uh, I think that one of the most incredible things that I have done in my short career is working with young people I think that the power of the collective of young people has so much energy and you know like sometimes we are at this point where like we're really exhausted and we don't want to keep going but the power of young people and the energy that young people bring to the table is is like a boost for for us um and i also think that when we we, we also have to take care of ourselves when we are doing this work because this work can be really exhausting physically emotionally mentally and I think that the best answer or the best advice that I can give is what we do at the Youth Coalition is that we make an assessment and it's like, okay, is this space really worth our energy or how can we achieve this goal in another way? Uh, like who, who, who are our allies? And I know that this is tricky because sometimes like our allies or like the people, the, the stakeholders who are supposed to be our allies also tokenize us, right? But I think that having like these very like clear expectations when you partner with other folks, when you are entering in a space on like how the youth want to be treated throughout the processes is a good way of also like taking care of ourselves and, and establish those limits. So I think that that's what I have to, to share right now. Thank you for that. Uh, any of the other panelists want to chime in for that question or? We can move on to the next one because there are several more. Okay, moving on to the next one. Uh, a question for Dr. T. How has the experiences and learnings from COVID-19 informed how global SRHR organizations like UNAIDS co-create and co-implement interventions with grassroots youth-led organizations like Youth Health Africa, Youth Lab, and Youth Coalition? That's a very important one. And um, UNA is being a great example of um, a UN agency that really does amazing work. Um, the current leader is very politically aware um, and really has provided some of, uh, I think, the most incredible leadership in terms of the COVID-19 um, vaccine inequity. And of course, um, the you know, UN AIDS mandate being very HIV focused, a lot of their commentary and work are, around this time has been to ensure that services continue, that um, you know people who require PrEP are able to do so. And um, actually had a very interesting conversation with the executive director, Mewi Nibianima, about how you know on the African continent, for example, all the condoms are, ex are imported. So the African continent doesn't even produce its own condoms. So I think when you think about grassroots youth-led organizations, we need to start thinking of the youth as well in terms of leaders in industry, leaders in industries where we know that we need commodities, we need reproductive health solutions. And um, you know, some of these bottlenecks, I think, can be broken and some of these ceilings can be shattered if we have these meaningful engagements with youth. And, I, and I've said this before, that you need, the youth has to be at every decision making level from your district to your province, to your state, nationally, regionally. 
And that's one way I think of ensuring that the work can carry on and that we can all support each other because it requires longevity. You know, we are all exhausted. We are trying to survive the pandemic in a capitalistic society that still demands us to be productive regardless, right? So there's a lot going on. And so we need to be able to, to let go of the silos um, and collaborate better. And the funding sometimes is a hindrance because some youth organizations get funding from the places they get it. And it comes with clauses that then say they can work with other people who provide abortion services, for example. So it means me as an abortion provider, my ability to collaborate and work on the ground with other youth-led organizations is completely um, not going to take to take off just simply because other institutions for their own survival have to get these grants that then come with these clauses. So it's something that we have to be advocating about and more vocal about um, some, some of the harmful foreign policy that influences humanitarian aid and philanthropy, and of course, aid on behalf of certain governments. And I think it's very important um, to realize also um, that you know the power lies with the people. It really does. Um, and a lot um, can happen because of advocacy of, of young people, yeah. Thank you so much. And in the interest of time, I'll jump to our last question here. Grace asks, the report highlights the, the severe and appalling state of SRHR services for marginalized people. As an LBQ young advocate, knowing the exclusion of young LBQTI in terms of programming and being in decision-making spaces, how do we push forward to be inclusive and what measures to take? Grace, did you want to ask a specific panelist? Uh, could I please have Dr. T again, uh, as it is related to the report? And I welcome other panelists to please chime in. Thank you. Yeah, look, I think there, there are different ways and activities, right, that we can advocate. And I have found the use of social media and, and traditional media as a whole very effective um, as an advocacy tool. And I started doing that, you know, for, for contraception, I started doing that for um, sexual pleasure and demystifying sex and pleasure, especially for um, for women. And, and it has worked, you know, I, I, I write opinion pieces started in my own country, you know, built up that um, expertise and, and the thought leadership up to a point where, you know, you get published um, uh, internationally and people have interest in the work that you do. And I think that's one of the things I will say is, is, is look, what are you good at? If you're good at writing and doing media, do that so that other people who are good at policy you know, can, can advocate at that level. Um, and that's why even as a healthcare worker, I keep saying that the practice of medicine itself is advocacy, is pushing for inclusion. And that's why, you know, I view it as a human rights defense. And, and whether or not I march in the street as a doctor or a nurse or a traditional, um, you know, healer, in how I practice and how I do my work, is inclusive. And that is also one way of doing the work of advocacy. It's not only limited to speaking to um, parliamentarians or legislators. It's, a, it's an important thing, um, but it's not only limited to that. So even what you are doing every day, do that really well. Um, and it all adds up, um, you know, and I have this analogy that I always say, if, if you light the little corner that you occupy, if everyone did that, that light will fill the room. You know, but if you are in anguish because the room is so dark to a point where you can't even illuminate your own space where you are at, then the, the room can't lit, light up because we are all so much in anguish and, in, in, and we are not moving simply because we are not doing enough. We are doing enough and it's a lot of work and it's, and it's hard work. And sometimes you can't do anything because it's, it's, it's just so much. Um, but I think it's about also keeping up to date with uh, possible legislative changes. What I find um, sometimes that doesn't work in our favor is that we come onto the process a little bit late. 
when the bill has now been announced and signed into law, then we start making a noise. So we kind of have to have a monitoring system um, that alerts us to some of these um, changes that are being proposed. And of course, it, people are very sneaky about it. And they do try, of course, to make sure that civil society is kept out. But I think do the best you can with, I mean, imagine if we had feminist, feminist accountants, Imagine if we had feminists in HR, right, who understood that women most of the time use their leave, um, their sick and annual leave for their children and the extended family to a point where they can take time off to do a screening for a pap smear. And it's not that black women are dying of cervical cancer because we don't know it exists. We are dying because we can't access services because capitalism is killing us. Right. If you are working in a low paying job um, in New York, you have no labor protections, um, you have no social security. If you take one or two or three days off um, to then have further investigation to stage your cancer, then get chemo and radiation, you are worried about your job security. And so we have to make those linkages and, and being in, 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 in inclusive of gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation is important as being inclusive with um, disability. People who use drugs, many young people use drugs and they actually end up in the criminal justice system and, 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 and then they get lost to the system. And then they, you know, so th there is a lot in terms of how we can, um, we can demand our presence in decision-making policies. We can demand um, inclusion and remember policy is dynamic. So it doesn't mean that because an act or a policy has been there for 20 years, it, will, it cannot change. If there is new evidence, if there's new research, and that's why we need feminists in academia, right? To bring us the research and the evidence that will influence policy. And we can make those certain demands and say the context has changed. Here is the evidence of what is happening. And this is why this law needs to change in order to enable you know, this type of, inclu of, of inclusion, yeah. Thank you so much for this. And uh, we are running a little bit over time, but I would like to invite Itu and Laganolo to please add some maybe closing remarks or if you want to address any of the questions, um, please. I guess I'll come in here and think about um, the last question, which is um, about um, LGBTI in terms of programming and being in decision-making spaces. I think it's quite interesting to begin to think about like this cisnormative and heterosexist world and think about like how in truth, there may be people who are um, LBQTI in these spaces, but because of how hostile the environment is, these people are not able to invite people in and say, hey, I'm lesbian or I'm bisexual, I'm queer. I'm trans, you know, I'm, uh, I'm intersex. Because in, automatically when people are, when you invite someone in, there's certain expectations, right? People, because of how heteronormative the world is and how cisnormative is, people will relate to you as, you know, someone on the margin, someone who's different, right? So oftentimes you find that people are choosing to not invite people in and I'm using the word intentionally invite people in because um, coming out of the closet or coming out makes it seem as if the system is the correct thing and you're entering the system whereas inviting in allows us to have a conversation that says you've always lived your truth you're just now extending a uh, space for other people to come with you with your truth right so I think for me it's to think about how hostile the hostile world we still live in how being queer, being trans um, is still something that is frowned upon, you know, like people still use like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you gay. I can't believe you lesbian as a slur, right? So we need to think about in, in, in that climate, how are you able to show up uh, as your full self, right? Um, but I think more importantly, um, you speak about how do we push towards inclusivity and measures. We just like, I, <laughs> I, I, I speak often about like this idea, we dismantle uh, like gender, right? Like if we do away with gender, we open up so much space for people to just be. And please hear me well, the dismantling or the 
um, doing away with gender is not saying that women cannot exist in their womanhood. It's not saying that men cannot exist in their women. It's literally saying we don't have to be essentialist about what maps or what looks like a woman, what looks like a man, what walks like a man, what walks like a woman. woman. It's literally to say for me, when we are being gender inclusive, when we believe gender is a universe, we're saying that we're creating space for all of us to exist. And in that space, we begin to become more exclusive, right? But I think in the little ways that we do it is to um, honor people by um, introducing yourself, right? Um, just being practiced and be like, hi, I'm Little Honolo. My pronouns are they and them. People don't understand how powerful that is because when cis people do that, when people who are you know, assigned female at birth and identify as female, when they do that, they allow everyone to be able to identify, right? and to be able to enter this space as who they are. You're literally creating space for other people to have humanity. And those are the little things in which we can begin to have inclusivity uh, and, and, and programming. But without that, right, we, we know that when queer people become visible, that visibility also attracts violence, also attracts scrutiny, also attracts criticism. So in many instances, I think that, um, we need to dismantle a lot in order to create space for all of us. Thank you so, so much for that. Um, I want to respond, but I wanna invite E2 to say some brief last words, please. And then uh, we're already running over time and we'll have to close, unfortunately. Um, hi, so yeah, firstly, I'd like to um, just reiterate everything that Little Honolo um, had said, you know, especially um, they really opened up, you know, my perspective when I first heard them talking about, you know, this idea of inviting people in instead of, you know, coming out. And I think that's also, it, it adds um, the importance of the use of the language that we use, right? So it's very important um, that even in our um, activism, in our advocacy and in our unlearning and relearning, that we are conscious of the language that we use when, um, you know, talking about the experiences of, you know, um, people who are marginalized, right? And a lot of the times I found that the language that we use has the potential to, you know, perpetuate further harm because it disenfranchises people um, who are already on the outskirts of mar marginalization. And it also kind of like, it has its victim blames, you know, um, whereas we should always think about, you know, the fact that this person is a victim to the system. So for example, when we are talking about the challenges um, that women, girls and um, gender and sexually diverse people are experiencing, I think we should definitely shy away from labeling it as girls issues women's issues right because then it, it it creates this impression that these challenges or these issues only exist because i exist right and that isn't the case right the this the issue here is the system right and so the issue is the system in relation to my level of marginalization but the issue does not exist because i exist i found it here and my you know my position um on the on, on the on the margins of oppression is what exacerbates it right and so i think that is why it is most fitting that at a time when the lives of um girls women and sexually and gender diverse people are even less of a priority um dr t um as a policy maker um really like you know centered us right and made sure that um we we continue to you know apply this intersectional um approach to to the work of advancing the rights of you know marginalized people and again i'd like to you know thank her um, for that and i think also outside of just policy um, I'd like to say that we definitely, you know, owe each other um, this, you know, sense of, you know, community, right? So, um, sorry, I, I definitely think that we, we need to see a, a change in social attitudes and behaviors, you know, where we start to recognize each other's humanities and we are conscious of how we treat each other and how we relate to people who are marginalized, right? Like we 
as humans, right, we definitely owe each other that sense of community. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so, so much to everyone. I think we've, we've talked about technical aspects. We've talked about very tender, honest conversations about what things mean for us personally. We've talked about personal responsibility. Um, this has been such an informative and beautiful conversation. Thank you to all our panelists for sharing all that information, advice, expertise with us. Um, I'm sure all of us are going to be thinking about uh, a lot of things that have been said because a lot of very important things have been said today. And of course, thank you, Dr. T for being here, for writing the report and for being so honest about listening to us and accommodating us. And yeah, we're, we're just very grateful. We can't wait to see what the future reports hold. And thank you very much, everyone. And thank you to our partner organizations for helping us organize this, this event today. Thank you, everyone. And hope you have a good evening. Good night, everyone. Good thank afternoon. you. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you again. Thank you, Shiv and um, E2, and I don't see where are the others. Did they already leave? I think so. Yeah.